<laughs> so once again, welcome to this amazing program about how to sow, sow seeds successfully this May with Petra Pageman from Fruition Seeds. <laughs> thank you, Stacy, and thank you all. And I'd love to begin with a little quote. And then I'd love to share a little 15, 20 minutes of just basically a long, lovely litany with a bunch of lovely tips in between of seeds to sow in May. And then we'll have an extensive Q&A. And so anytime you have a question, whether it's a tiny little, I don't know, is this an embarrassing clarifying question? No embarrassing questions. Just put it in the chat. And if you have a huge existential question, I have plenty myself. And the chat is a perfect place for those as well. <laughs> so I would love to begin with these words from Robin Wall Kimmerer. I think that the service berries show us another model. And let's back up for a moment. Service berries, also known as June berries, also known as shad bush, beautiful, beautiful native trees with sweet, sweet, beautiful apple-like, but kind of cherry-like, delicious fruits. And so, yes, this is Robin's quote. I think that the service berries show us another model, one based upon reciprocity rather than accumulation, where wealth and security come from the quality of your relationships, not from the illusion of self-sufficiency. Without gift relationships with birds and bees, service berries would disappear from the planet. Even if they hoarded their abundance, perching atop the wealth ladder, they would not save themselves from the fate of extinction if their partners did not share in that same abundance. Hoarding won't save us either, friends. All flourishing is mutual. I love those words from Robin all flourishing is mutual. And so I'd love as we begin to just offer up these ideas as the beginning, the foundation perhaps, before we even sow a single seed more in our lives. I wonder, has the idea of self-sufficiency and talk of your garden ever limited the potential of what you plant. I know it has limited my potential. And I wonder what would change if we all thought as our gardens, as in you thinking of your garden and me thinking of my garden. What if we think of them as our gardens? And who in our immediate communities benefits from our gardens and the gifts of our gardens, the abundance of our gardens? And how can we plan to thank them for those gifts? Whether they have two legs or four legs or hundreds of legs or no legs, <laughs> what are all the beings with whom we wouldn't survive without dear friends and dear earthworms? <laughs> So yes, in the spirit of abundance and growing greater abundance together, I'm so honored to jump into 10 seeds, easy seeds to sow in May. And let's break that down. What are 10 easy seeds? So what I mean by, this, by saying easy, they're direct sown. So you don't have to worry about starting them inside and transplanting them. Just go ahead and sow them directly in the ground easy peasy. Also, many of these are large. <laughs> How many of you have sown seeds that are just really too small to even see. And how do you pick those up even? Here's a hot little tip. Take a toothpick and moisten it on the tip of your tongue and they pick up tiny little seeds very easily. But all of these easy seeds to sow in May, they're all for the most part on the quite larger side. So that makes them easy to sow as well. And seeds to sow in May, not transplant, but sow directly in the ground. So these will be focusing, we'll be focusing on the varieties of seeds that you can just sow directly in the ground. And finally, in May, I mean, that might sound obvious, but what I really mean by that is one month before frost, what are we sowing here in zone five? 
what are we sewing right now? And in the middle of the month and around final frost at the, toward the end of May. And sometimes it's the middle of May, but it's also been the beginning of June that we've had our final frost <laughs> in the last nine years that we've been growing here at Fruition Seeds. So the final frost, we always air on the later side rather than the earlier side. So yes, 10 easy seeds to sow in May. So let's jump into peas. It's getting to be final call for peas, friends. And peas are delightfully easy to sow. They're great big seeds. And there are full-size peas, there are dwarf peas. And especially if you're planting on the later side, maybe consider, and mid-May is final call for when to stop sowing peas. They don't love to germinate, and pardon me, they don't love to just pollinate in the middle of the heat of the summer. They also won't be as, they'll be way more fibrous and they'll not be as sweet. So if you're planting mid-May and still want to get some peas in, go for the compact, more dwarf varieties. And those have earlier days to maturity. And that way you'll be able to harvest that much earlier and that much sweeter of pods. And next, roots. And there are so many roots, whether it's radishes, let's talk about radishes real quick, salad radishes specifically. Mm. And salad radishes, I just mean by that, whether it's the French breakfast or these lovely little cherry bell, Sora style radishes. Salad radishes are radishes that are less than three, four weeks old when you harvest them. The little dainty golf balls are smaller. Um, as opposed to watermelon radishes or black Spanish radishes, which I love, but you'll see they have over twice the days to maturity, twice the days to harvest. And so they're a better fall radish than spring. If you've already planted watermelon radishes, no worries, just harvest them incredibly quickly when they're very small. Don't expect them to get to be the size of a baseball, much less a grapefruit. <laughs> harvest them young because here's the thing, as they're maturing into the heat of summer, instead of growing roots, they're going to just focus on flowering and going to seed and they're going to be much more bitter, much more spicy, much more fibrous. And so, yes, that's true for radishes in general, but especially these full season, these much like 50, 60 days to harvest radishes like watermelon radishes. So when I say radishes in May, I definitely mean these lovely little um, Sora style. And oh yeah, Korean radishes, if you've got those long, lovely, um, brilliant radishes, those are much longer days to maturity also. So plant those here in zone five, plant those in the beginning of August and your daikons will be massive and marvelous. Basically, if your radish or your turnip is going to be larger than a golf ball, <laughs> that means it's going to be better grown in for maturing into the fall rather than maturing into the summer. And so next, let's talk about some other roots. It's finally time to sow beets here in zone five. So I love to plant beets after the daffodils blossom. And so let's just back up for a moment and talk about germination rates and temperatures too, because whether it's those peas, radishes, arugula, anything else we talk about tonight, all seeds germinate on a bell curve, where at a lower temperature, they'll germinate, but not as quickly. And at a optimum temperature, they'll germinate really quickly and higher than that optimum temperature, they also won't germinate quickly. And so the nice thing about peas is they have such a wide germination time, right? They can grow in like 38 degree soil. It might take them four weeks to germinate, but they don't rot, they don't die, which is amazing, most seeds would. And certainly garden seeds as well, especially, but, pea, but beets don't have as wide a germination rate. And radishes, you can also start plant super early and they'll take longer to germinate in cool soils, but they'll still germinate pretty quickly. Beets, we found that if we plant them before the daffodils are blossoming, that they just take a long time to grow. And then we tend to be weeding 
more than eating beets. <laughs> so I highly recommend just holding your horses. And now is a perfect time to be growing beets as well as Swiss chard, the same <laughs> genus species, fun fact. And anytime after the lilacs bloom is what we look for for carrots as well. You can totally plant carrots now. If you have already, don't sweat. They're going to come up. It just takes them that much longer to germinate in cooler soils. Even in the warm summer soils, carrots can take two, even three weeks to germinate. So especially in cooler soils, it can be quite some time. So other, other roots that we sow in May, parsnips are a full season crop. So getting them in the ground now is great. And I want to show you this little tip too. Perhaps you have seen floating row cover in your life. <laughs> you can do lots of things with floating row cover, but one of them is to have season extension, exclude insects from your vegetables, but also, especially with our old tattered I'm this is very new, unsullied, <laughs> bright white <laughs> row cover, but with a few seasons under her belt, she'll be quite brown and raggedy, but don't throw her away yet, because at that point, it's perfect to put on your freshly sown beets, carrots, parsnips that take a little bit longer to germinate in cool soil, they'll warm the soil gently like a little greenhouse. Don't put up them under hoop, over hoops, just right on the soil. And then also this wonderful phenomena of whether it's raining or if it's really dry and you're going to be watering that bed so they have consistent germination, then you're actually watering this floating row cover instead of the soil. So then you're just that pressure is being dispersed on the floating row cover rather than the soil dispersing seeds and soil along with it. So that's a wonderful way to continue to reuse before you throw away your floating row cover and get pretty tough seeds to germinate like germinate like parsnips and carrots to germinate with much greater um, much quicker rates. And next, let's talk about greens. There's so many greens that you can sow in May. And where do we even begin? <laughs> Certainly, it's final call for spinach. Spinach, once it gets to be the time that it's Memorial Day, and if you're wearing shorts consistently, <laughs> it's way too hot for spinach. Spinach is a cool loving crop. We literally planted in September and it overwinters. We've been eating our spinach that we're just harvesting now that's just bolting, going to seed. We've been eating it since last October. But if you plant it now, it's going to very quickly be bolting and going to seed. So if you are wanting to plant spinach in your life, I don't blame you, me too. <laughs> and so, but go for it. It's final call for planting spinach directly in the ground here in zone five. And a quick little shout out for Asian spinach, tatsoi, which you can grow both in the cold and in the heat of summer. So if you're still wanting to grow something like spinach and enjoy all summer long, Asian spinach is your go-to. Keep in mind that it will bolt and go to seed eventually. And if it's stressed, this is in the mustard family. It's supremely mild and so tender, succulent, and like bright mineral flavor, so similar to spinach. But if it's stressed, it'll have more of those sulfur, bitter brassica compounds. So just make sure she's well weeded and lots of nice compost and you won't think twice. And other greens that you can grow now are it's a final call for wintergreen mescaline mix. But honestly, we have our three other different varieties of mescaline mix that are more for summer. So even if you plant both of these now, you'll be surrounded by that much more abundance. Mescaline mix, a fabulous and super easy seed to sow in May. Also arugula, also baby bok choy, <laughs> don't hold back. And if you haven't already planted kale in your life, kale is supremely easy to grow. Just make sure that you're thinning it. If you want it to be full size, we'll talk about thinning soon. And if you're wanting to grow kale for salads in the summer, I highly recommend this bare necessities. It's more of a leaf of kale than a feather of a feather of a kale than a leaf of kale. And here's the thing with all of those little tiny rivulets of leaves, 
the fibers of the leaves are much more fine than in a big wide leaf of kale. And as a result, the fibers being much smaller, it's much less tough, much more mild, much less bitter. So if you're wanting to eat raw kale in the summer, just like us, bare necessities is your go-to. Another green to sow now is spring rub. So yeah, check it out. Not broccoli rub, but it's synonymous with broccoli rub and also rapini. Um, and broccoli, you don't want to direct sow. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon, we must have someone at the door <laughs> that our dogs are greeting and <laughs> Matthew will kindly let them in. <laughs> Transparency of facilitation. We love you and all of your little dogs too. <laughs> and so yes, broccoli you don't want to direct sow. Not an easy seed to sow, but this broccoli rub by contrast. So broccoli and broccoli rub, totally different plants. Broccoli you only want to transplant. Um, and But this spring rub you can totally direct So and it's fabulous. And also Swiss chard. I love Swiss chard and it is a perfect thing to be sowing now as well. And also who knew cilantro loves to grow in the cold. Um, and also you can grow it in the summer. You just need to be transplant, pardon me, direct sowing it more consistently because as the heat comes on, it will want to bolt all the more quickly. So we've been sowing cilantro. We honestly, we sowed cilantro in September. And just like that spinach, we were eating it throughout the winter. And about three weeks ago, it finally started to bolt and go to seed. And we've been, we pulled it out and we've been sowing every two weeks, just a fresh batch of cilantro for ourselves so we can be harvesting cilantro sweet, tender baby cilantro um, for the rest of the summer when we sow every two weeks from here on out. Um, also in the greens department, it's lettuce season, finally. Lettuce takes her time germinating in cold soil. So now we've been transplanted. We sowed lettuce indoors to transplant out. A month ago, we sowed indoors. So now we're transplanting them out. But if you want to just keep it simple and direct sow them, I don't blame you. And to winter density is what I would go to first and foremost now, since the soil is still on the cooler side, this will just leap right out of the ground. Also, who knew romaines love to grow in the heat of summer, but they also have great cold tolerance. So romaines also are wonderful to sow in the cooler weather. And, and by the end of May, we'll be sowing those full on heat loving varieties of lettuce and you'll see on our website, lots of different, all the different varieties. You'll see them on the spectrum of cold hardy to cold, heat tolerant and when to plant them throughout the seasons. And also now let's talk about flowers. It's final call like this week, final call to establish poppies while the soil is still on the cool side is their time to shine. Um, and also sweet peas as well. And here's a couple other flowers, whether it's borage, phacelia and calendula. You can also direct sow these flowers. Um, and right now, even before frost and they will grow just marvelously for you. And there's a few other things, flowers that at the end of the month we'll get to. I can't wait to share those. And also I wanted to lift up potatoes are fabulous and easy to sow in May as well. It may not technically be a seed, <laughs> but I think you'll forgive me. <laughs> I hope you will anyway. <laughs> so potatoes are wonderful to sow in May. We love to sow them two to three weeks before the last frost. So we've been green sprouting them for about a week. We'll green sprout for another week before we plant them. And green sprouting, it just looks like this is a tiny little Russian banana fingerling, by the way, so tender and nutty, so flavorful. And green sprouting looks like laying them in a flat, like single layer, giving them as much sun as you possibly can, letting those eyes grow. But if you've seen potatoes grow, 
<laughs> right? Just in a dark cabinet, they grow those long elongated sprouts and we don't want that. We do want those sprouts when they emerge to have full light so that they will turn green and beautifully photosynthesizing and those eyes will stay short and stocky. And then we plant them with those little green sprouts on them and they germinate. They effectively grow and resist rotting so much better. So if you're interested in potatoes and oh my gosh, in so many things, we have a whole six page free to potato growing guide that you can download on our website at fruitionseeds.com. And if you haven't already, and especially if you're curious more things about green sprouting and so many things that I've lifted up tonight, you'll find a growing guide um, for many of our varieties and we're making more all the time to share. And then finally, at the end of May, here are a few things that we will be direct sowing that are super easy. <laughs> so at the end of May, I mean to say, when you're confident that it's not going to frost anymore and the, that soil is warm enough. So things like summer squash, also winter squash, also cucumbers, also melons, also sunflowers. No, I love, I mean, they might so they might grow in this and beans and corn as well. They might grow if the soil warms up really quickly. They might grow earlier in the month. The soil is warm enough, they'll start to sprout. But here's the thing: if the temperatures get less than 32 degrees, they'll die. So I grew up, you know, always wanting to sow sunflower seeds and summer squash earlier than my father wanted to. But here's the thing, we would watch the sunflower seeds sprout from underneath our bird feeders <laughs> and be like, dad, isn't it time? Isn't it time? Can we sow them yet? And he'd be like, just wait. And sure enough, so often there would be a frost and all of those little lovely sprouts of sunflowers underneath the bird feeder would be down on the ground <laughs> and just you know, had frozen out. So yes, often these things will sprout in, in soil warmer um, than the end of the month of May. But the thing is the night temps. And so just keep an eye on that 10 day forecast. And as and we're always um, sharing what we're noticing as well on social media and on our emails. So we will definitely let you know when we are sewing these things, friends. And yeah, I'd love to now open it up to, I see, I saw a bunch of wonderful questions come in and so eager to jump in. One question, Petra, was um, back to the cover you showed. This person's curious, so do you water right on top of the cover? Yes, yeah, with that floating row cover, you just water right on top of it. And ideally still something like not imagining if you have a hose, not like full bore pressure is still not going to be good for it. But if you have even a, just a sprinkle setting um, or a watering can, that is perfect. And you can use either um, light insect netting, like row cover like this. This is very light and basically it's for insect exclusion. For example, excluding cucumber beetles from cucumbers, from squash, from melons. Um, and so we're literally just covering the plants and making sure that <laughs> they can't actually go in and lay eggs on this plant. So that light, really, that light fabric also works for, for germinating seeds more quickly. But the, honestly, the heavy, the heavier weight for the season extension really works too. You just want to be sure that if it is that heavier weight, you take it off as soon as they germinate because this light fabric lets lots of light in, but the insect, but the season extension is much thicker and you're only getting about 70% the photosynthetic capacity. So you don't want to <laughs> reduce their seedlings growing. So as soon as they germinate, um, you can take the, the row cover off. But if it's this light cover, you can totally keep it on and they'll grow that much faster because it acts like a little greenhouse. Wow, so um, Renee is curious because she green sprouted her potatoes and the sprouts turned purple. Is that a problem? 
<laughs> it's not a problem. It depends on, so that's so fabulous. I love the color purple and I love potatoes. <laughs> and so here's why it's not a problem. Some varieties have more purple leaves, especially at the beginning when they're just burgeoning compared to green. So that's true with peppers too. Like our collage pepper has much more purple leaves than green. And it can be concerning as a cotyledon as like a seedling stage, but don't worry, that's totally normal. And also um, some varieties, so some potatoes are more purple than others. And also they'll tend to be that darker purple green because those red pigments, which red overlaid with green is purple, are actually pigments protecting those tiny little green leaves from the sun. It's kind of like sunscreen. So that's what, if you see whether it's, you know, red on lettuce, for example, or take a look at your jade in the middle of the summer. If you have a jade house plant, like the mar outer edge of the leaf will be red. So that's just protecting the new growth from the sun. Um, Iron Clouds wants to know if you use a potato fragment without eyes, can you make more potatoes or will it just rot? It will just rot. Um, sometimes, I mean, potatoes, when you harvest them, you can't tell where the eyes are. Um, I mean, you can make edu very educated guesses, but you know, if you, so I would recommend um, just letting it green sprout. But yeah, if you've let it green sprout for two weeks and you're not seeing any eyes, that would be a concern. Um, but if it's a big old potato and it's just not sprouting yet, I, especially if it's an organic potato, I just give it a little more time. Conventional potatoes have been sprayed with chemicals so they don't sprout. So they're shelf stable <laughs> in an industrialized food system. We see you, oh my gosh, reasons to eat and grow organically. Um, so don't expect conventional potatoes to sprout, but organic potatoes, within two weeks, they should be sprouting, especially if it's now, you know, the after dormancy, they've been cold for a while, and then it starts to warm up their enzymes, take a little while to get into motion. But once they're in motion, there's no stopping them. <laughs> um, Bonnie had a virus on her tomato leaves last year. And she's wondered, wondering if she should be concerned this year, if she plants them in the same garden again. It depends. Some and with any, whether it's a virus, a blight, if there's anything unusual on your on your tomato leaves or on your potato leaves, they transfer lots of diseases back and forth all the time. Take pictures of them and you can send them to us to help diagnose. You can also send them to Cooperative Extension to diagnose. It's really important to get a diagnosis on it because you know, without knowing what it is, it's hard to know what it is and how to prevent it in the future. So some diseases are airborne, like late blight, early blight, septoria leaf spot on tomatoes. They're literally spores that blow up from down south. So they're not going to be in the soil at all. Rotating crops make sense for other reasons, but not to prevent late blight. So you can literally plant <laughs> a, a tomato where you have tomato had late blight last year. And if it gets late blight again, it's not because of where it was. It's just because you know, millions, untold billions of these spores are wafting up from down south every summer. So other viruses and other bacteria and fungal diseases are soil borne and are going to be in the extension, pardon me, in the soil for sometimes years to come. So it's really important to get a diagnosis on it without an actual diagnosis of what it is. It's impossible to say, but in lieu of that, rotating your garden. So like making sure that you're not growing tomatoes in the same place and tomatoes and everything else in that solanid nightshade family. So that's everything from tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplants, ground cherries, tomatillos. They're all more susceptible to certain kinds of diseases with each other. So if you can rotate those throughout your garden your garden will be that much more abundant for lots of reasons and disease mitigation being one of them. And if you're not looking in the chat, I'm going to read this out. Michelle says she works for Cor Cornell Cooperative Extension and 
they do insect plant and soil testing for a very small fee so if you have something you want tested i'm sorry petra <laughs> Oh my gosh, no, it's fabulous, Michelle, I love it. And actually, if you'd love to come off mute, Michelle, and share anything further, I'd love folks to feel personally yeah. um, introduced to you. And Me. <laughs> yes. well, thank, you. thank you. Yeah, actually, I work in the nutrition department and I do, um, I just actually sent an email to you today, but um, I do community nutrition and I've done some community garden development in the inner city. So more of urban organic gardening. Um, but we have a diagnostic lab. Um, I think the pH testing is only $5. So you just take a small sample from wherever, whether it's a raised bed, if you're trying to do turf improvement on your landscaping or whatnot, take a sample from the, the lawn if you're having a problem growing in a certain area. Then if you have a tree or a plant that's either has some infestation or blight, just bring in a leaf or two. Um, and then same with insect, you know, we have ticks coming in right now and all sorts of creatures, but um, yeah, it's a, I think five to $15, but um, I know the diagnostic lab has been really busy, but it's a great service to really um, hone in on exactly what is the problem. And then they always give recommendations too um, with it. So a little plug for my office. Michelle, we love you. <laughs> well, thanks. A round of virtual applause for all yeah. of your work and your great. I'll take a free plug wherever I can. Right? <laughs> oh, oh, it's it's a great service. I mean, I, and any extension does it. I'm I'm actually in the uh, Monroe County, so I'm out at St. Paul, um, and I work in the city. But um, you know, there's one in Livingston County, Ontario. There's an extension almost in every county. If you have a link to all of those links. Could you drop that in the chat? I think so. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And feel free to email that directly to me too. I'd love okay. to hear that widely. Yeah. That is so yeah. amazing. If it gets emailed to me, I could put it in the description of the video. Just so <laughs> I'll make sure I get the right link for you. So I'll see you. <laughs> yeah, take your time. Thanks so much, Michelle. We have a question from Sherry who's curious when do you take off the row cover? Um, even if it's the light one that she has bought from you another year. Um, and or do you add hoops as the carrots get taller? Yes, as soon as so here's the general rule. If you want if you have something that's only six inches tall or less, you don't need the hoops over it. And let's talk about hoops. I brought one. I love show and tell. <laughs> so these you can use, of course, anything sticks work, PVCs, whatever you I mean, be creative. We love these spring steel hoops because um, they bend into any number of configurations and the alloy is such that they can bend all different configurations and they take a long time to actually break. So we grew, we bought a few hundred of these in 2012 when we started fruition and we still have them and they're rust free. They've been bent all over the place and <laughs> they're amazing. So if they're less than six inches tall, you don't need hoops or any kind of loft because at that height, you're not going to be inhibiting their growth. As soon as the plants are six inches or higher, you really want to get some loft and they're going so that they can just grow unhindered. So that's the, that's the breakdown. And then also for things, if you're using that floating row cover as insect exclusion, for example, you know, making sure that those <laughs> cabbage loopers aren't, you beautiful butterflies aren't laying their eggs on the underside of your cabbage and kale and broccoli and Brussels sprouts leaves. Um, that is fine for those crops. But if you're excluding something like a cucumber beetle from a cucumber, that cucumber needs to be pollinated, right? Brussels sprouts need to be pollinated when they're flowering, but they're not gonna flower in this first year. So the cucumbers, we have that floating row cover on until they start to flower. And then the moment they're flowering, we take the covers off. And at that point, the cucumber beetles come flooding in. But at that point, the plants are full size and they're already going for it. And that, that taxation of having to live with the cucumber beetles, they just continue to thrive. And they, it's like, you know, as adults, we have a more robust immune system 
and are way healthier than, you know, really, really young people. So think of it in that uh, similar um, allegory as well. Does anyone else have any questions? I think we've covered all the questions. Um, there is one thing, actually, it's for Michelle. <laughs> Sobia, Sobia, I'm not sure if that's how you say your name, but um, she's wondering if her samples can be mailed in if they're not in the United States. Um, I actually answered those two privately. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, didn't know you were I just, I did respond. Um, I would almost probably say no, just because um, there's, um, there's disease and soils that are prone to this area and more localized. So the diag the diagnostic lab lab might not be familiar with other things that go on. And, um, I think even other States really, um, because areas are, are susceptible, you know, like right now it's the ash borer and the gypsy moths and, you know, certain beetles. And so, you know, there's definitely key things that are, um, known to this area. So. That's the only reason why I would say, and uh, I'm glad to hear that um, I can't Sherry that said there or somebody said that their kids are enjoying. Um, I'm assuming she means 4-H programming. Um, so that's great um, with COVID. Yeah, 4-H yeah. does a lot of um, youth programming, um, anything with environmental to uh, just everything. They do everything. <laughs> so thanks. Amazing, amazing. One more cover question. Do you do the same thing with the row cover removal for the cucumbers flat and then the hoops? Oh, actually, because we generally, we just put the, ho the, ho the hoops right on them at the beginning so that we don't have to come back and put them on later. Um, yeah, so great question. And also because with the cucumbers, we just were like, you're going to be jumping out of the ground. We plant them at the end of May, beginning of June, and that warm soil, they just are huge seedlings and they grow so quickly. So it might be, you know, it might be two weeks that it would be flat and then under the hoops. So we just skip that flat stage. We put the hoops on right away. So glad you asked. I'd love to also put in a quick note about thinning because if you're direct sowing all of these crops, thinning is so important and thinning is so hard for so many people and so understandably. And so let's just talk about it. So certain things you don't need to thin. So for example, that, <laughs> that mescaline mix or baby arugula or lettuce mix that you wanna harvest as baby leaves. You can sow that really nice and dense um, and you can be really confident that, you know, it's going to grow, I mean, too dense, it's going to be way too close. But you know, if you're, if you're spacing the seeds out, you know, a quarter inch and then even away from each other because you're harvesting them this tall, that's just fine. But basically everything else you need to be thinning. And so the best time to thin is early and often. <laughs> so the younger you can thin, the less stressed the plants will be, especially if they're plants that are creating roots. So beets, for example, if you're thinning them and they already have two sets of true leaves, they're going to be just growing no bigger than a spaghetti, a wisp of spaghetti <laughs> for a root because they were stressed at that point early on in their lives. And beets too, fun fact, beets and Swiss chard, beta vulgaris, they have they're multi-germs. So you think you're sowing one seed. And in fact, there's likely three, if not five or six apical growth points burgeoning from that single seed. And that's different from most seeds, right? You plant one radish seed and you can be confident that's one radish plant and one corn seed will create one corn plant. But beets and Swiss chard are really unique and they will have multiple growth points from that one single seed, making thinning absolutely essential, especially with beets, especially if you want to harvest large, lovely beets or even small, lovely beets. <laughs> so a thing to keep in mind, thinnings are delicious, <laughs> is one of the ways that I love to harvest and be thinning are every most things because 
you're eating the beets anyway, right? And I know it's so hard to kill living things, but you're going to be eating them anyway. And so essentially you can harvest them as microgreens and then as baby greens and then as baby beets and then as full size beets. So, and the same is true for lettuce, for arugula, for all kinds of things that you may be thinning. Baby bok choy, you can totally be um, thinning as you go, giving those plants more space. If the plant's leaves are starting to overlap, that's a sure sign that it's time to go ahead and thin again and have supper again with those thinnings. <laughs> um, Kate is wondering, is there anything that could that could start to be hardened off now? I'm running out of room under my lights. I was thinking something like catnip, calendula, calendula or marigolds? Yeah, so absolutely. The catnip and calendula are totally cold hardy. So go for it. Harden them off. Um, that the marigolds are not cold hardy. So keep them indoors yet, but you can put them outside on warm days. And so that will allow other plants to have more space under the lights. Um, and other things that you can be planting out now, if you have anything, I mean, anything cold hardy. So whether it's lettuce, kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, if you have arugula or spinach transplants, those are all cold hardy things that um, you can actually go on our website too and just do a filter um, for products, I know vegetables that are cold hardy. And then you'll see all of the varieties that are cold hardy. And then you can use that as a filter to say, yes, now I know what to plant out. Um, we also have these, you can find them on our website, um, little planting calendars too. Um, so these are really handy and you can get find that free download as well. And oh, I forgot to mention, we have these lovely direct sow charts as well as transplanting charts. And there's so much information on them. And this is in our Rise and Shine Starting Seeds with Ease book. And that's just 40 pages of whether it's indoor sowing or direct sown in the ground, tons of awesome info. It has direct sow charts and transplanting charts. And we have beautiful paper copies on our website, but you can also get the free PDF download on our website as well. So, and that PDF download is, um, there's lots of glorious pictures all throughout this, but the black and white version, the download is a PDF that's black and white. So it's really printer friendly as well. Um, but yeah, start and hardening them off, send them outside now for five to seven days. So they're acclimating to life outside, getting used to rain falling and breezes and temperatures being dynamic. Just keep in mind that even if they're cold hardy, like this switch shard, if it's been growing in my cozy kitchen for a month and then I put it outside and it freezes that night, it might die. If it doesn't die, it's gonna be really set back. So if those first three nights, you can have those seedlings not experience freezing temperatures, but cold, but not freezing, then that almost, it's like they remember their resilience. They lean into and like that brings out their resilience. So after that four or five days of after three nights of not getting frosted and after five days or so of hardening off and transitioning outside, you can be confident that even if it snows again, <laughs> even if the snow accumulates again, <laughs> that they won't be daunted. They're broccoli. They've survived millions of years of incredible diverse, dynamic, ever-changing weather patterns. And so it won't phase them. They just haven't been evolving for millions of years to go from cozy 70 degree kitchens to snowbanks. So just make sure that that acclimation period is, um, is important. And two, if you're interested in hardening off, this next Wednesday, I'm sharing a whole, our free sewing and growing webinar series is continuing with potting up, hardening off, and awesome tips for transplants. So um, yeah, Stacy, I see you wanting to jump in, jump oh, in. There are, Renee says there are several internet sites that claim you can grow two pepper plants together 
without thinning that they were planted in one cell. How do you feel about this? <laughs> I feel like the internet is a fabulous place to find anything under the sun. And it's just terrifying, um, whether it's, you know, learning about how to organize and what a democracy really looks like, or learning that, you know, white supremacy is the way to a domination culture and how we continue that kind of <laughs> work in the world. Like you'll find the full spectrum. And so, you know, there's no right and there's no wrong. Um, there's everyone has their unique experiences that I wouldn't want to deny. So if someone has grown two pepper plants adjacent to each other in the same cell, they plant it out and those two pepper plants are growing adjacent to each other and they're happy with the harvest, I don't want to tell them that that's not a valid experience. I also know that planting that I give plant, I give peppers <laughs> at least 16 inches away from each other. And if plants are overlapping in leaves profoundly, that's just asking for competition above ground for light, below ground for nutrients. All of those extra leaves overlapping are just increasing humidity, which is increasing your susceptibility to disease. When I was little, I, in my father's garden here in the Finger Lakes, if we harvested five red peppers on a plant, we thought it was an abundant plant. So I think too, we don't have, we don't necessarily have the imaginations. I, speaking for myself, I don't have the imagination to know what's possible always and often. And so when I was little, we thought five red peppers on a plant was an awesome pepper plant. Now, if our pepper plants are, we have less than, 30 ripe bell peppers on them, we don't share those seeds because they're not well enough adapted and we know they can do better. So, right, it's so that person that thought they grew two peppers close to each other that both thrived. <laughs> I think they were more akin to what I was experiencing in my childhood garden and they may just not know <laughs> what might be possible. And I don't want to demean or diminish their experience in any way. And I think it's really a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> but don't take my word for it. Go ahead and test, test, test. And I'm constantly learning things that I wish I had learned decades ago. And I know if I'm so fortunate to be in my 80s on a rocking chair, just telling you all kinds of stories again one day. <laughs> I'll continue to say I'm still learning things. Um, and some of those things I'll learn on the internet and the other things that I learn on the internet will just be comedy. <laughs> um another question about row covers sort of um so what about watering if you don't have soaker hoses what's the best way to water cucumbers or other other veggies that are under the row covers if you have something that like a, a watering can that can evenly disperse water rather than be a very like hard stream from a hose, that would be best. Also, if you are concerned about watering and you don't have a, you know, I always recommend drip irrigation over soaker hoses because you know, those soaker hoses have holes all over them. And so they're spraying water in every direction, which we only need water in one direction and that's down toward the roots. Anytime, especially here in the Northeast that we're sending moisture, humidity, water is the primary vector for every disease on the planet. So anytime we're sending water up into the foliage and letting it sit on stems and leaves, we're just asking for all kinds of diseases to take hold in those places. So anytime you can use drip irrigation and have those drips actually go, you know, a gentle drip down rather than a spray all over, that's infinitely better. And also mulch is an amazing tool. And advantages aren't always advantages. Disadvantages aren't always disadvantages. Where there is mulch, there are slugs. <laughs> so you know, mulch is not this silver bullet, but mulch is amazing and it suppresses weeds. It retains moisture. So if you are planting cucumbers, you could also do something where you have this open bed and you, know, you only need a cucumber plant two feet away from another cucumber. There's a lot of space between those cucumbers when they're first seeded. And so you could even, if you are putting 
that uh, mulch that bed and then put a little flag in where you push back the push back the mulch and plant those seeds and then you'll that way even if the mulch covers over the hole a little bit you'll be able to see where that flag is and make sure that um that you can come back and make sure those seedlings are coming up but that way those seedlings are coming up in the mulch and so you, they won't need nearly as much moisture um, coming from above or from you specifically um, great question um, megan is curious can you transplant broccoli if they just have one of their own leaves or should you wait Great question. It so depends. Ideally, I'd like to wait till they have two sets of true leaves, but honestly, it really depends on the size of the container they're grown in, of the soil, whether it's a soil block or a cell tray, they're not all the same size, right? So if they're, if it's a smaller, just like a standard six pack, I like to plant those out really quickly because anything that isn't a soil block, anything that has a solid, um, a solid layer of like plastic around that the roots are going to become root bound in, I like to plant those out as early as possible to reduce their root binding. Um, so yes, if you're growing broccoli, I love you <laughs> and uh, it depends on the size, but we, with our two inch soil blocks, we let them get their second set of true leaves. Um, but honestly, especially if you're growing in a cell tray or a smaller size with less soil and thus less nutrients per volume, you, it's always better to plant out a younger, it's often better to plant out a younger transplant um, than an older transplant because younger unstressed seedlings will surround you with a lot more abundance compared to older, more stressed seedlings. Um, question about onions and leek seedlings. Do they need to be hardened off? Oh my gosh, everybody does. Everything that you grow inside, um, it just makes sense. Do you want to harden them off, acclimate them to life outside before you just throw them in the ground? Even though they want to grow, it's kind of stressful, honestly, to just be thrown in the ground. So it's having all of those other variables, whether it's wind, rain, temperatures, dipping and rising, just acclimating to all of those other variables by the time then you throw them in the ground and expect them to grow new roots. It's just, it like, you know, it lowers the curve, the bell curve of stress. And also when you're planting them out, I love to dunk all of our transplants in dilute fish emulsion, or if you have compost to make compost tea, just a quick little dunk in that water, in that compost tea, in that dilute fish emulsion. It's like packing yourself a snack before you go up a mountain or making yourself two sandwiches if you're really going up a mountain, which your plants are totally climbing a mountain. <laughs> it's a, a huge journey. And especially if you want them to make it to the top and have a great big broccoli head like you want them to be as healthy as happy as least stressed as possible so anytime you can just give them a little snack on the way that always it helps me yeah. and the next question follows really well with the one you just did when you harden off do you just take them outside for a period of time and then bring them back in is that all there is to it you don't bring them back in. And here's, I'll, I'll share with you a few more thoughts on hardening off and I'll encourage you to join us on Wednesday, Wednesday night. And you can also watch the replay of our sewing and growing webinar series. Our, this Wednesday, we're talking about potting up, hardening off and a bunch of general tips to knock transplanting out of the park. So with hardening off, you want to take them outside and ideally you're not bringing them back in ever. Ideally, you're putting them out on a day like today. Today here at Fruition Seeds is really gray and it's warm and it's drizzling a little bit. It never rained. And so it's just, there. it's more light, more direct light than they've ever experienced in their life. But it's nothing like a full day of blazing sun. So ideally that first day of hardening off is a day like today that's nice and overcast and warm, but not hot and maybe a little drizzly. 
today doesn't get any more textbook <laughs> picture perfect. But in lieu of that, it is nice to gently encourage them, expose them to a little more light. So if you can put them outside so they're experiencing all the temperature dips but only have them say eight six eight hours of light and then the next day a little more light and the next day a little more light because those plants can totally sunburn. I've sunburned plenty of plants, just like my Polish nose. <laughs> and so it's really easy to do, especially by the end of May um, when it's hot and just, yeah, and the sun, you know, every day from here to June 21st to the summer solstice, there's just so much more light every single day. And also resist watering. Um, you don't want them to get bone dry, but you do want them to just, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're getting used to the fact that you're not coddling them anymore. So while you don't want them to get bone dry, if it's really hot, be sure to be watering them. But otherwise, you're letting them just acclimate to life outside. The only time you'd bring them back in is if it's um, a cold hardy transplant that it's going to be frosted within three days of being put out. And then secondarily, tomatoes. Think of tomatoes, peppers, like plants. They're not just frost sensitive, they're cold sensitive. So if you're hardening them off toward the end of May, they don't want to experience 32 degrees, but also they're stressed below 50 degrees. So it's the easiest thing in the world, one of the most common mistakes in the world to be planting them out too soon. And just because it's quote, after final frost, doesn't mean that the nights are going to be out of the 40s, um, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's a few thoughts and there's so much more to share and I can't wait to share more in that webinar on Wednesday. Um, question about natural fertilizers, specifically the ones that you happen to sell. Um, what should we be applying right now or this month? Mm, oh, wow, what a fun question. So it really depends what you applied already and when and what your and like shout out to extension again and huge cheers to michelle for um, being a part of extension and for joining us tonight if you it's so important to get your soil tested and if you haven't already it's just my my, my mom really had to convince me that tying my shoes was great. I was really convinced that I could live my life with Velcro. And I'm really glad that she did. It just seemed like a lot of work at the time. <laughs> and it's the same thing with soil testing, where it just seems like a lot of work, but you just have to do it a few times. And all of a sudden, it opens up your world. And you suddenly, whether it's the pH is important, but knowing what your macronutrients, your micronutrients, it just is invaluable. We love to, we do all our soil testing in September so that we get our tests back much earlier than if you so, if you start, if you send in your sample now. So many people are just doing their tests now, but there's no better time than no, no better time than now, whenever now is. But the nice thing about fall too is that by then you can really, you have the winter to plan and know how you're going to amend your garden. But that being said, we have a lot of different ways that you can take care of your soil, even without knowing exactly what's going on with your soil. Compost is almost always a good idea. Borrowing having too much phosphorus in your soil, just adding compost is just going to do wonders for all of your soil and all of your all of those micro tiny 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 little creatures that are actually the foundation of your soil resilience which is the foundation of your garden abundance not to mention feed your crop as well so anytime you can incorporate compost which i love whether if you have if you're tilling your garden we put on an inch of compost before we till we also have our um our all-purpose um, just granular fertilizer, which is has humates in it and is beautifully soil building as well as just long-term slow release fertility. So that's kind of our long game of fertility. We'll also sprinkle that before we till. And if you also want to put on our compost crumbles, those have a little more nitrogen in them and just more quickly bioavailable fertility. So if you're really wanting to grow you know, more long, more short-term things like lots of beets, 
lots of salad mix. That's a great choice um, to also to incorporate before you till in. So then as you're tilling in or like double digging beds, that's a great option. If you're doing no-till gardening, we love you and just put on that fertility before you put your next layer of mulch on. Um, and also as we're transplanting, so if we're digging a hole and we're putting a little bit of any of those kinds of fertility on um, as we're planting. And that also counts as like a row of peas. You can, if you didn't work it into your soil prior, you can just sprinkle it into that trough as you're planting your peas. And yeah, then there's the fish emulsion, which is just an incredibly, it's like two sides of the same coin. If you're adding compost, adding more granular organic fertilizer, that's one side of the coin. That's like soil building. And then the fish emulsion is like just dreamy, delicious, the garnish on top, the cherry on top, the, you know, that's like the taking the vitamins to make sure that you're getting everything that you need. So there's over 100 micronutrients in that fish emulsion and every two weeks we're spraying everything with it. Um, foliar feeding, so plants literally, leaves will uptake nutrients <laughs> through their leaves rather than not just through their roots, which is amazing. Um, and you can also root drench it by simply putting, diluting it into a water, watering can and just putting that water right on your roots as well. So yeah, there's a few thoughts and now is a perfect, fall is my favorite time to be adding amendments um, to soil, but the second best time is every other time. And every time we're planting a tomato, there's a handful of compost, there's a handful of fertilizer, you know, just um, kind of in that similar vein as Robin Wall Kimmerer, just inviting us to think about abundance and generosity and reciprocity. You know, we live in such, such a demanding convenience culture and we want to you know receive and then give back but learn I think one of the ways gardens have taught me is to give before you expect to receive anything and so giving whether it's in this for a form of fertility or you know any number of things gardens teach us to to give and before we expect to receive. Um, another question from Sherry. Do you know of a drinking water safe drip tubing? And do you recommend the flat or the, or the harder round style type hose? I love the flat hose myself. And oh my gosh, that first, hmm, that first question, drinking water. Can you repeat that? Drinking water safe drip tubing. So drip tubing that you can just put tap water through is how I think, how I'm interpreting it. Carrie, are you on? You could you could unmute yourself if you want to clarify. Hi there. How are you? So good. How are you? I love the way you're thinking. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about hoses and drinking water and such and a lot of the hoses have um, like the California Prop 65 warnings and just funky stuff. And um, some of them have BPAs and all that. So anywho, I have been looking for um, drinking water safe hoses so to water my garden with so it doesn't transfer garbage to the plants that we're gonna be consuming. And so I was just about to pull the trigger on my first drinking water safe garden hose, but it was a soaker hose. And now you <laughs> recommended the opposite when the flat was my first choice. <laughs> so, I, but I was like, oh, maybe it should be the soaker. So <laughs> I will go back to the drawing board before I purchase now. <laughs> Perfect timing, Petra. <laughs> I love you so much. I have to go find. I know what we use as drip doesn't have the California 65 and any of those BPAs. And I'm trying, it's funny, I can see the label, the logo, but I can't think of what the company is actually called. And I confess we get it in like 300, 3,000 foot like rolls. <laughs> so I hope uh -huh. they have smaller quantities. 
Yeah, stay tuned. I'll ask. I'm sure Matthew will be like, oh, yes, it's la la la. I mean, it's something it's a drip line with some little fun embellishment. But yes, yeah. it totally exists. It totally exists. It I'm totally sure. Exists. I, I, I will find it. <laughs> Yes, I'm so committed to this. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Andrea is curious, can you mulch with compost? Oh my gosh, did I already say at least three times? It's like my favorite phrase. Advantages are not always advantages and disadvantages are not always disadvantages. So yes, you can totally mulch with compost. Compost, especially home compost often has weed seeds in it. Mm -hmm. So in terms of adding organic matter and fertility, check. In terms of like suppressing the weeds that were growing on, like that were at the surface that you just covered up, check. But in terms of reducing weed pressure overall, it really varies what kind of compost you're sourcing. So if you can get um, more, not, I was going to say industrial, but I'd like to not necessarily say industrial because certainly there's industrial composting, which has been, you know, raised to a certain temperature for a certain period of time that will kill any and all weed seeds. Um, but not all, like we have compost at the farm right now. We share it online and we also share it as you can scoop your own compost. It's $7 for a five gallon bucket. We're open on the weekends between 10 and two and we have organic gorgeous transplants and of course seeds and marvelous things and nesting bluebirds and lots of com great reasons to visit. Um, but with that compost, it's made for by our friend John just over the hill in Branchport. And it's not industrial, but he is like industrial scale, but it's like, it's artisan and he's making sure it's getting to all those temperatures. So it's totally weed free. So yeah, I don't often, I prefer to use straw as mulch myself or my favorite is deciduous leaves that have been sent, sent through a chipper shredder as long as they're not black walnut leaves. And those, I mean, that's just the dreamiest fertilizer you'll find on the planet. I mean, there's a reason here in the Northeast our soils are so deep considering there was a mile of ice, of glacial ice above us 15,000 years ago. We've built soils up so quickly because of those deciduous leaves. So anytime you can be, you know, people will bag them up for you and leave them on the side of the road. <laughs> Thank you, we'll take them all. <laughs> and there are certainly liabilities to be found in bags on the side of the road as well. Um, but yeah, if you are confident that you have you know, deciduous leaves that aren't black walnuts and you can use those as mulch. That's a, those are my favorite mulches. How do you get the big mulch wood chips out of the garden before the next season? <laughs> oh, this is a tough one. Um, you know, prevention is the best cure. Anytime you can not put big chips of wood into a garden bed or a place that you want living things to grow. <laughs> so much the better. Um, use that. They're phenomenal for mulching paths. And also if you just have like paths through perennials or something, but if they're, you're mulching around Brussels sprouts, it's just going to all of the carbon in that, in that wood is going to be soaking up nitrogen and stealing it from your, stealing it. If you will from your plant so yes if you have tons if you're it's tricky I mean if you have a lot of them it might be worth digging up some of your soil and sending it through some kind of screen so that you can do screen it out in some way um, but yeah anything that you can do to remove chunks of wood from from beds where you want to, to grow vegetables or even flowers and herbs your, your abundance will be that much greater. <laughs> um, another question in the same vein, is chopped straw good to use as mulch? We used bark mulch last year and we had way too many slugs. Oh, yes, slugs are always going to be a thing with mulch. There's practically no way around it. Um, you're creating a more moist, um, dark habitat. And so that's just where slugs live. So that's kind of, you know, it's like, 
it, you can't have an omelet without breaking eggs. And that's just one of the costs essentially of, of having mulch. But I do think straw is going to be way better for you in terms of bark, just as we were previously talking about with wood, anytime you can, certainly the, the dense lignans in the inner heartwood are going to be really problematic in a garden, but even bark um, is much better as mulching a path as opposed to um, a garden bed. Um, best of luck. There is a product called Sluggo, um, like slug dash go, like Sluggo, and it um, it's kind of great. And I don't know exactly what it is. It's a form of salt, but there's other things. It's Omri, it's organic materials, it's organic approved. Um, and so you put a couple little granules around the base of your transplants. And for whatever reason, slugs are, are like, no, thank you. So we use a lot of mulch on our farm and in our gardens, and we use quite a bit of sluggo. And um, yeah, we found beer attracts more slugs than <laughs> kills them. <laughs> but again, try it all and don't take my word for it. Try it all. <laughs> well, at this point, we're um, past seven. We're about at a quarter after. So this is going to be the last question. And Petra, before I ask it, is there a way if anybody has further questions that did not get answered that they could reach out or should they wait till June's um, session? Or <laughs> yes, we'll certainly see you in June. I can't wait. And thanks again to the Rochester Public Libraries for making these conversations so beautifully possible. And in the meantime, you can always reach out to us. Um, our Heather at fruitionseeds.com. Heather is our phenomenal community care coordinator, and she honestly knows so much. You are not getting second fiddle when Heather is playing the fiddle. <laughs> and she, she's amazing. And um, you can also reach out to us on social media, but I recommend emailing. You'll get a, um, that's just a, that'll be a better way to connect with us. So yeah, Heather at fruitionseeds.com. And if Heather doesn't know, she's really good about um, just sending them on to me and then we'll all be sure that you know we're here to not just share seeds and share these tools but to really share the the experience of growing together it's not easy to grow gardens and it's so much fun and just like with anything that's fun or anything that isn't easy it's always nice to do those things with friends and it just makes a better experience in joy and in struggle <laughs> so thank you so much for continuing to reach out and you can also come visit us on the Farm. Every weekend in May, we're open on the weekends between 10 and 2, and we have beautiful seeds that all kinds of compost, fish emulsion, that row cover. We have thousands of glorious organic transplants to share. So many tomatoes. You'll find the full list of everything we're sharing on our website at fruitionseeds.com. And oh, um, yeah, I would love to just remind everyone to take notes as well. And just, I always think I'm going to remember things. <laughs> and I so rarely do. And a little shameless plug, we made our Across the Seasons calendar. And I loved just earlier today, um, a few days ago, lifting up like our May, which has, you know, all the dates, one, two, three, four, five, but instead of Monday through Sunday, there's years. And so I just had the best time looking through May and realizing that the Baltimore Orioles returned back to our farm three days earlier last year than they did this year. And two days from now, the Meadowlarks returned last year. I can't wait to see when they return this year. And of course, all kinds of things like, oh my gosh, it was 75 degrees degrees on May 3rd last year, but then it snowed on the 9th. <laughs> and so like, I just love, and of course, when we're sowing, when we're potting up. And so it's just a huge delight um, to experience the present moment. <laughs> but then I, well, I love those little ways of making little notes so that I can easily look back on them and remember both the joys and the struggles and hopefully see some emergent patterns. And it's because of taking notes like that, that I'm really confident that if the daffodils are blooming, 
our bean, our beats are going to come up really quickly. <laughs> so I encourage everyone to just pay attention. And it's one of the greatest gifts that we all have been given of these senses to enjoy them and also just see the patterns. There's, you know, so much, so much pain in this world and there's so much beauty in this world. And thank you for bearing witness to it all and growing gardens and sowing seeds as one of the most radical forms of love and of democracy that we have. Thank you, Petra. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> well, do you that want to ask awesome. a question? The last question could be just a yes or no. It's, is horse compost good for the soil? <sighs> yes, and I don't like to put it on soil myself because horses often have ivermectin. Um, ivermectin is this super powerful dewormer. And so I'll never forget going when I first moved back to Naples a little over a decade ago and a friend invited me to, she had all of this just mountains of composted horse manure. And she's like, you can have as much as you want. And I was like, wow, that's exciting. So I found a friend with a truck and we brought our shovels and we started to shovel and we shoveled like five feet into this mountain and then even deeper. And we didn't find a single worm. And I didn't take any of that compost. So I don't know how long, I haven't done any research of how long ivermectin lasts in soils. Um, and, our, and I also have plenty of friends, I'm thinking specifically of my dear friend Sal over in Canada, who has a few beautiful horses and she composts all their manure and she has one of the most resplendent gardens I've ever seen. <laughs> and so I know that it's possible and it's far from the worst, um, but I personally tend to shy away from it just because I like worms. <laughs> and I want them to be abundant and everywhere <laughs> in our gardens. <laughs> well, thanks again, Stacy and Judy. Thanks again, Michelle, for joining us. And thank you all for just joining on this beautiful May evening. And I look so forward to hearing about all the things that you're learning, all the things that you're sowing. And happy spring. Did I'll I mention? See you next month. <laughs> see you in June. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thanks, Petra. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you.